Okay. <clears throat> Test me. Test me one, two, three. Hi, my name is Pastor Keith. Welcome to our online uh, service. I'm the pastor of Grace Baptist Church uh, here in Cumberland, Maryland. And I'm so thankful that you have come to join us uh, for our online Bible study this morning. Um, we are, this morning, uh, we talked about getting plugged in. Uh, we are actually having our uh, in-person service today at 11. And if, if you can make it, we'd love to have you. We're going to be uh, continuing to practice caution, wearing our masks and uh, social distancing and everything. Because um, uh, we want to be careful. We do have an elderly population. Um, but, uh, but if you can join us, we sure would love to have you. And uh, before we get started uh, in the study of God's Word, would you bow your heart in prayer with me? Lord, we just want to come before you and thank you and praise you. I thank you for all those who have come and have joined us today for this study. Lord, your word has endured long before we've been, long before any of us who are listening to this or are participating in this uh, have, have existed. Your word has stood true to the test of time. And sometimes, Father, we get so caught up in our own realities that we are blinded to the spiritual to to we're blinded to truths that are not sometimes not even spiritual sometimes just a, a truth that's around us that we get blinded to and and, um, and I pray that Father uh, that you would open up our eyes this morning open up our eyes that we may see give us a glimpse into another realm a realm that we don't see naturally with our eyes but may we get a glimpse of it today. And Lord, I'm humbled and amazed that you would even consider using me to speak your word, Father, um, to share your truth. Because Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm grossly inadequate in so many different ways. But you, Holy Spirit, are totally adequate. So speak to me. Speak, uh, excuse me, speak to us. Through me. Yes, come in, in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are, um, <clears throat> have you, as you know, we've been doing this series. Uh, if you've been following with us online, um, we've been doing a series of knowing heaven, knowing where you're going. <laughs> and uh, today's title of today's lesson is Living Between Unseen Realms. Um, kind of uh, the, the goal we're going to try to do is to help us to understand where we're at in this whole grand scheme of things. Uh, we talked previously about an effective end game is uh, a mindset, like having the idea of knowing where we're going uh, is crucial for our spiritual outcome and for our, for our spiritual growth. It changes the way we do things. It affects everything that we do. And uh, last week we talked about um, that, you know, how God has made us for a place called heaven. And uh, we were also made to be in a relationship with Jesus. The, and both of those come together. They're both sides of the same coin. We're both made to be in a place. But we're also made to be in a relationship. And today what we want to talk about is how God's word reveals to us the reality. Or, or it, it reveals to us. Uh, the next slide, yeah. It reveals to us the reality of the unseen realms. In other words, the things that we don't see. Uh, and gives us what we need to know about which realm we're going to spend eternity. Um, and so that's what we want to look at today to, to help us to see uh, a bigger picture. Now, we don't have one particular verse. Uh, you'll notice on, on this slide, I just put multiple verses. And so we're not going to be standing and reading from God's Word today. Or um, we're just going to, get, oh, and if you have your Bible, I'll have the references and I'll say the references if you want to just turn into those references uh, when you can um, that would be uh, good so you want to have that open and ready if uh, maybe you're not as familiar with uh, the scripture and where to find things um, one of the things that you may do is uh, if your Bible has these little um, these little markers in, in the back what you could do is you could take or excuse me in the binding you could take uh, your Bible and open up to the front and you'll find a, a table of contents in there and uh, what you could do is take one of those little uh, strips and uh, just just take it out of, of your thing, like so, and just put it in there. 
So that uh, most a lot, a lot of Bibles have at least one. But if you don't, you can keep a, a mark, a, just a sheet of paper or a pen or a highlighter or whatever. But something so you can flip to the table of contents quickly find uh, find the reference. So you can see I'm looking here at the table of contents. It gives me the page number. Everybody's Bible is different. Um, so uh, so it it could be help, important in helping you navigate quickly to uh, to the different verses. So I want to start with the question, what is heaven? And we talked briefly about that in the previous um, previous thing, but I, I want to understand, for, for clarity, I want to, I want to say when, when we refer to heaven, what we're referring to is this, the place where God dwells. If we understand the scripture, we understand that God dwells in a place called heaven. Now, we understand this from Scripture, that there is what's called like an intermediate heaven. This is a place where we go when we die. All our loved ones that have passed away that were in Christ, they're in this intermediate heaven. We'll talk more about that at another time. But, but basically, that's the place where God is going to is dwell, dwells, right? But later, he's going to create a new heaven and earth. He's going to, oh, everything here is going to be burned up, and he's going to recreate the earth even better here. It's going to be pure. It's going to be a a beautiful holy place and God is going to choose to come and live among his people and uh, and we'll talk about that more later in a couple weeks but I wanted to uh, to be clear that that heaven there whether it's the temporary heaven or heaven or whether it's the new earth um, that's going to be the place where God is dwelling it's the place where he is going to be and we talked some about that last week as well so now when we think about this for a second we know that uh, when we talk, start talking about heaven, there tends to be sometimes some skepticism, right? Uh, some people want to deny um, the existence of heaven. Some people want to deny the existence of hell. They want to deny the existence of spiritual realms. Um, I uh, was thinking some time back about uh, when I was working at a church, and um, there was a uh, there was a guy tuned our pianos and he was an atheist and he did not believe in God and he was very adamant against so and, and I tried talking with him a few times about you know about spiritual things but he just wasn't open to it but uh, but I enjoyed listening to him I enjoyed hearing the things that he had to say and the things that he learned um, but one of the things that he talked about was interesting was he talked about he was talking he was very fascinated with the idea of quantum physics and it's this idea that you know, if you, if you, and this might be a little confusing here, but like it's the idea that there's another dimension and what causes us, we can work through this dimension and, you know, you could take a basketball, for example, and you could turn it inside out, you know, and, and just, I know it's kind of weird way of thinking for us because we live in this and we're confined to the dimension that we live in. Um, but he was fascinated by this theory of quantum physics and about how there was a, another dimension. Um, scientists even at Yale and Harvard and uh, uh, Sanford have even written and talked about uh, and written articles about how they believe that there's multiple universes, as many as 10. Some people even saying that there's an infinite number of universes, right? We see this like coming over into our literature, coming over into our TV shows. You know, like if you watch any of the the Marvel uh, channels or any of the DC, I think it's DC, Flash, what is Flash, DC, like they talk about, you know, these multiverses and people coming from one multiverse to another multiverse. And if you're watching the new Superman, I don't know if the cartoons did this, but the, the comic books, but you know, that recently they've launched Superman out and now there's a Superman uh, in another dimension and, and, and one guy is coming over from that dimension and that universe coming into this universe and fighting our Superman and you know so it's this whole idea of multiple universes is is it's, it's not entirely new but it's but it's something that's really becoming more prominent and more outspoken of and people but yet some people want to say oh yeah there, there's this reality of multiple universes and yet we as believers talk about another dimension we talk about a spiritual dimension and then all of a sudden people clam up and um, and I think that we have to understand that there is 
this multi, this when we talk about this spiritual realm, the question pops up in our mind is this why can't we see it? And we're gonna talk about that some, but I want I want to state this that God in his perfect and merciful way has revealed to us the unseen realm of heaven. He's revealed that into to us by his word. And I do and and, and, and listen. And I believe he's revealed it to some people in some cases in some small ways. Not to make a grandiose statement about things, but just because he's an intimate God, he reveals things intimately in some ways to some people. Um, we'll talk about that a little more in a little bit. But but we start looking in Scripture. We talked about it a couple weeks ago in Genesis chapter 20, verse 12. When uh, Jacob, who had been following the Lord, I had a vision. It says he dreamed a dream in the stairway was set on its on the ground with its top reaching the sky and God's angels were going up and down on it. So here was a moment when someone in the history of, of, of our scripture actually got a glimpse into heaven, into the spiritual kingdom. They got to see something that nobody else saw. And this has happened throughout the scriptures in different ways. Uh, for example, if we jump over to the New Testament in Acts chapter 55, Remember, uh, one of the uh, deacons of the church, his name was Stephen, and he was a, a very, he was passionate about his Jesus. He loved his Jesus. And he stood before the religious people, telling them how God had been working all through the centuries, and how he brought to, in that specific point in time, he brought the Messiah to them. And in that specific moment in time, they denied him, and they killed him. And he told them, you guys killed him. And of course, this made them mad. So what did they do? They wanted to kill Stephen, so they started stoning him. And while they were throwing the stones at him, before he died, it says that Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven. He saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He got a glimpse of that. He got to see that, which is amazing. He said, look, I see heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. What a glorious glimpse of that. Um, we see another example in the Old Testament. If we look um, in the Old Testament, uh, in, in 2 Kings chapter 6, um, there was a, an incident where the uh, king of Aram was getting ready to come and attack Israel. And, uh, and, and folks were worried. And there was a, a servant who, um, he was uh, very faithful to the Lord. It says, when the servant of the man got up early, he went out and he discovered an army with horses and char chariots surrounding the city. What happened? The king, Ben. Uh, uh, Habadad, Ben Habadad, the king of Ram, actually came and brought all. When he found out uh, Elisha was around the city, he came and surrounded the whole city. He was like going to take that city out. And uh, and of course, the servant got up and he discovered this, and so he was concerned, right? He wouldn't be right. He meant like we're about to be taken over. Like that happens to us. We look at circumstances that surround us, that surround us, and and uh, and we feel like. They're gonna. They're, they're overwhelming to us, and uh, and so he comes to Elisha and he says, uh, in the next verse he says, uh, so Elisha, oh my master, what are we to do? And Elisha wanted the servant to understand the spiritual reality of what was around him. So Elisha says to him, uh, don't be afraid. For those who are with us outnumber those who are with them. What? How can this be? We're just a small people. We don't. We don't have an army as great as this as this country. We don't see. There's something that we're not seeing. And so Elijah prayed this interesting prayer. He said, "Then Elijah said, prayed, Lord, please open, uh, uh, please open his eyes and let him see." So look at the next verse. So the Lord opened the servant's eyes. Now watch this. And he saw that the mountain was covered with horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. What this servant got to see was the power of heaven surrounding Elijah. That God was going to protect his servant. God was going to do what he was going to do. And, and it like, you know, changed his whole perspective. Like, okay. There is a, a whole spiritual realm, you see, and that exists today. 
but we just don't see it. We're blinded to it. And there's only a few instances where we get glimpses of those kinds of things. And, and I've even seen incidents where sometimes even today God has revealed. Now, now listen. I, we have to be careful about people who say, you know, if we've been to heaven, we need to make sure it lines up with Scripture and everything. But I do remember one incident. It's a dear, a dear, dear friend of mine who was, when he was young, he struggled. He had lots of surgeries. He had uh, his umbilical cord was cut around his neck and caused some issues for him to be able to function. And he had to have lots of surgeries to be able to walk. His life really is a miracle. And all of his young life, he struggled medically and physically with a lot of things. That And, um, and God, in his compassionate way, reached out to this young man. And he received Christ in a way. Now, if you were to meet him and you were to talk with him, you would see, you would think, like, man, this guy is like he's limited in some kind of way. And um, but yet, his heart is so in tune with spiritual things. And one day, his mom comes and into his room, and he, she hears him singing a song. It was a song about the, about Jesus, and it was not a song like. Of course, they grew up in church, and he had heard all the familiar hymns and songs. And, but it was not a song that she was familiar with. She had never heard that song. And she looked at her son and said, where did you hear that song? And he said, my angels sang it to me. And here, at, the, at a certain point in his life, God had opened up the spiritual dimension that he could see those things. Now, he doesn't remember that now. But God came into that time in his young man's life, and God ministered to him in that way. And of course, of course, his mom remembers it very vividly. Remembers him describing that. Um, but so God, in His mercy, He is able to come and show Himself in these ways. But God reveals Himself even in big ways. For example, we see in Isaiah uh, how Isaiah gets it. like He like is in the throne room of God. It says that in the year of King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord seated high and lofty on his throne, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Imagine the glories of that. The seraphim were standing above him, they each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, with two they flew. Why would these seraphim have? Because God is so holy. And so they're covering up their uh, their faces and covering up their feet, not only because they're, they're honoring God, he's in the, he, they're in the holy presence. And they're calling out to one another. Like there's this, they're making this proclamation, and we'll look at this next verse. And they call out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. They are making a proclamation that needs to be made. That people need to understand that there is a holy God that is pure and righteous, and there is no sin in him he is completely filled with love and it, and it is such a holy presence that it says in the next verse it says the foundations of the doorway shook at the sound of their voices and the temple was filled with smoke as these seraphim are in this presence of a holy God and they are making a holy proclamation it is causing the foundations to shake and is causing this temple to be filled with smoke. So even in this presence, as Isaiah is standing there before God, why is the smoke there? It's smoke in part to, to, to veil some of the glory of God. Why? Because God is holy, and the reality is, is if we stand before him, we cannot live because everything that about us, all of our evil, all of our sin is going to be exposed. That's why he says this. He says, woe is me, for I am. Now, this is Isaiah. He's like a prophet of God. So, we have to ask the question, why does he feel ruined? Right? What? Why would, if this was a God, someone was called there, why would he feel ruined? What he says. Look what he says in the next part of the verse. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among the people of unclean lips. In other words, my speech is not pure. I, I recognize that I say things that are not right, I recognize that I say things that are holy. And listen, I even come from that place where nobody is holy. 
and, and he saw it and he felt that. And look what he says. And because what? Because my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of armies. You see? So there is this idea that there is the, the place where God dwells is a holy place. It's a right place. And um, and so when we think when we think about heaven, uh, a lot of people believe that there is heaven, right? Because right when 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 we uh, when we think in terms of of like uh, you know this life, it it can if you think, well, I'm an atheist and I'm gonna you know I, I want to die and that's it and that's the end. Um, that can be depressing if you're honest about it, because we like the idea that we have meaning. And that there's purpose in the things that we do. Um, but in America, at least, many people do believe at least there's some sort of heaven. There was an article written in uh, October uh, of 2003. It was called Next Stop, The Pearly Gates, right? And it was, uh, this is what um, Connie King said. She said, and, and based on a survey that was taken, an overwhelming of majority of Americans on the next slide, you'll see it. The overwhelming majority of Americans continue to believe that there is life after death and that heaven and hell, and hell exist, according to a new study. But look at this last part. But what's more is that, well, go back to that one. What's more is that nearly two-thirds think that they are heaven-bound. So you might be listening to this and you might be saying, well, yeah, I, I think there is a heaven and I think there is a hell. And a lot of people say, yeah, I'm going to heaven. Where are you today? What do you think? And what I want to, to, to propose to you today is to help you to come to that place where you understand where it is you will spend eternity. You see, remember what we talked about? So we've talked about how um, jo Jacob got a glimpse in a dream. We talked about how Others got glimpses into heaven, into the spiritual kingdom. And, and we talked about uh, even how one person, and there's others in scripture who were taken into heaven and, and they saw the throne of God. But there was a, a, but Jesus talked about another person and he got a glimpse into heaven. But it was interesting. It was the rich man and he was in hell or he was in Hades and he got a glimpse of heaven from hell. Isn't this interesting? If we look at Luke chapter 16, look what it says. There was a rich man who would dress in purple and fine linen, feasting lavishly every day. This guy was living a good life here. He had everything he could possibly want. He was lacking nothing. He had a home. He had plenty of food. He had plenty of clothes. But Jesus paints the contrast. There was a poor man named Lazarus, and he was covered with sores, and he was lying at his gate. Now, why would I highlight lying at his gate? Because this poor man was within the influence of this man who was rich. And this man lived his life every day, going in and out of his home, at the gate, going in and out of his gate, never paying one iota of attention to this man, this poor man that was at the gate. He never offered him any food. He never offered him any comfort. He never invited him into his house for a meal. Never gave him, and as a matter of fact, this is what it says about the rich, the poor man Lazarus. It says that he longed to be filled with what fell from the rich, rich man's table. And he thought, man, even if I could eat the food that fell on the floor. But he didn't even have access to that. But instead, the dogs would come and lick his sores. Now, in our culture, right, I, I, was, I was in my church the other day and I saw this man eating something. And he reached back, and his dog was back there, and he let the dog take a bite off it, and then he went and ate off of it again. And, you know, so in our culture, we're a little bit more comfortable with uh, with uh, dogs and the things that they lick and eat and, and eating after them, I guess. Um, but this idea in Scripture where dogs would come, and, and you know, it was the, they were considered kind of like the outsiders, like the, they would run around and eat off the streets, and... Uh, they would find their food and satisfaction, you know, maybe in the garbage and things like that. But so it was the dogs who were coming and ministering to this poor man, um, and they would they, how they were doing it by licking his by licking his sores. And then the story goes that one day the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's side. Again, this is that what we talked about briefly at the beginning, 
that sort of that temporary place before the the new heaven and earth are going to come. Um, and uh, so he was there by Abraham's side, and we call it Abraham's bosom sometimes. But it says also the rich man died and he was buried. So both of them died. So now comes the what? The time of judgment. Right? And he says, and here was the rich man. And being in torment in Hades. Now what is that Hades? Hades is what we would call, in other words, in other words, Gehenna. Or place of judgment. Place. Sometimes we would say hell. But just like there's a temporary heaven, Hades represents a temporary hell as well. You see, we talk, we see, just as we see a new heaven and earth coming in the, in the book of Revelation, we also see that there's a permanent judgment coming, uh, uh, what they call, what the Bible calls the lake of fire. Um, but, so he's in this temporary place of judgment, right? And he says he looked up and he saw Abraham a long way off. So he could see Abraham. He could see the poor man that was at his gate that he never paid any attention to. He could see that Lazarus right there by his side. And um, so we, we see that there's this whole idea that he's able to see the heaven from this perspective. He's getting a glimpse of this. And so what happens? He says, Father Abraham, in the next verse, uh, he called out, Have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip his, the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this flame. In other words, he's saying, you know, I never reached out when this man was in agony. Now he's still thinking lowly of him, right? He's a servant. Abraham, I recognize you're a great patriarch, but he's just a little servant. Why don't you just, you know, send him over here to give me a drop? And still no compassion that you even had for Abraham right now. But but he said, son, Abraham, remember, remember that during your life you received your good things, just as if Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here while you are in agony. And there's the other reason. Besides all this, um, uh, the, a great chasm is fixed between us and you, so that those who want to pass over from here to you cannot. Neither can those uh, from there cross over to us. In other words, this is a permanent situation. This is what's going to happen now, from now into eternity. He's demonstrating that there is a permanence to this. And there's, we are living now in a time in this place while we're here on earth when we can make decisions, when we can, when we can fix our, our, when we have a choice, when we have a, an opportunity to, to look at both realms and, uh, and, and, and we have an opportunity to, to, to do something about that here. Once, once we enter into this, into this phase, you can't do anything about it. So, um, so this, this might the question is it unloving to talk about hell right hell is a horrible nasty place nobody likes to think about it right I mean people joke about it which is highly unfortunate because it is a real place um, but uh, but we say you know it's not it's, nobody wants to talk about judgment you know nobody wants to speak about you know that there's you know oh yeah so I'm living a, a, this life and yeah, I'm basically a good person, but you're telling me I'm going to die and go to hell? And um, we don't want to hear about that. Um, but yet, do you realize this? That Jesus talked more about hell than anyone else in Scripture? That's indeed, that's correct. For example, he said things like in Matthew chapter 10, he said, Don't fear those who are able to kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. In other words, don't worry about the things that are temporary here. Don't worry about what these other people are doing. Pay attention to what God is doing. Pay attention to the one who is the ultimate judge, the one who is going to judge us for our deeds. Or he goes on there in Matthew 13. Um, and we talked some about these verses when we did the Kingdom of God series. But he says, Therefore, just as the weeds are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. He's given an illustration to people as he's talking about like farmers. You know, you take up when you're uh, when you're gathering up the junk that's in your yard, your garden, whatever. And you, you know, you, it's not useful for anything. You just burn it up, right? He said, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels. For what? Well, he said, and they will gather up from his kingdom all who cause sin and those guilty of lawlessness. In other words, everybody who's committed sin which is all of us. 
They will be, he will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Right? So look at how he describes heaven. I mean, hell. It's like a furnace. It's a blazing furnace. It's going to be hot. It's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This, this cringing and this is going to be like, you know, ah, you know, how you like, ugh, like this, you're in agony. And it's like, oh, what am I going to do? Like this gnashing of teeth, right? Or he talks about in Mark chapter 9. He says, if your right hand causes you to uh, to fall away, cut it off. It's better for you to enter into life main than have two hands and go into hell, the unquenchable fire. He's talking again about hell. Or if your foot causes you to fall away, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life main, lame, than to have two feet and be thrown into hell, right? Or, or he goes on, if your eye causes you to fall away, gouge it out, for it's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than it is to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. Look where he describes where the worm does not die. Imagine, you know how we die and the worms get into, you know, compost and start eating it and, you know, they're going to constantly be eating on you. Sometimes I wonder, like, some of these graphics you see, like, in some of these new modern movies, you see these skeletons. Uh, what's that one about the pirates? Uh, pirates of the Caribbean, right? And, you know, they're coming back and they got worms and things like that crawling all out of them. They're, like, constantly alive, but they're dead, right? It's, like, nasty. And then, again, where the fire is not quenched. Or in Matthew chapter five, uh, chapter 25, he talks about the permanence of it. He says they will go away into what? Eternal punishment. Punishment is eternal. But the other side of the token is the righteous will go into what? Eternal life. So there, we are in this place now. And there is an eternal realm. But there is an eternal realm of judgment. And there is an eternal realm of life. So we have to ask the question, where do you think, are, I'm going to ask you this question, where do you think you are going? Now, we got to know this, that there is a default location that is everywhere that everyone is going to. All of us. You see, we have to understand this. As we talked about the holiness of God, Habakkuk said this in, in, in his prophecy. He says, God, your eyes are too pure to look out evil, and you cannot tolerate wrong. God is a holy God, and he just cannot tolerate evil. And that's a good thing. And the problem, what the problem is, is that what Paul says in Romans, he says, for all have sinned and fall short of the, glo of the glory of God. And even Jesus talked about, he says, when you talk about the uh, two different ways, or two different gates to get into this, to get into this, this other realm, he says, what he is, his admonishment is this. What he says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate. In other words, there's multiple gates. But the one you should choose, the one you should go to, is the narrow one. And then he describes the other one. He says in the next part of the verse, For the gate is wide and broad that leads to destruction. So the reality is, is that the road to destruction, the road to damnation, is wide. And the unfortunate thing is, is that there are many who will go through it. So maybe the survey says like, oh yeah, 75% uh, of the people think that they're going to go to heaven. Um, you know, that's that's a pretty large portion of people. If we need to we need to think about this question. We might think that we're going to heaven, but do we know? You see, because Jesus said this about the other gate. Look what he says about the narrow gate. In the next verse he says, how narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life. In other words, the, the right gate, the gate to heaven, the gate to the spiritual realm, the gate into the heavenly spiritual realm, it's a, it's it's not very wide. There's not a lot of options to get in. Matter of fact, there's only one. And it's difficult. It's hard to get in. Not because of, you know, oh look at all the things I gotta do and I can't achieve all those things. No. The difficulty is the stubbornness of our own hearts. You see? And this is why he says, look what happens in the next part. Few find it. Few people are going to find it. So here's the reality is, is that we are living between these two realms. And uh, we realize that, um, that there is evil that's going on here on this earth. But there's also good. You see? And so we can see some of heaven here on earth. We can see some of hell here on earth. Matter of fact, Randy Alcorn in his book said, The best of life on earth 
is a glimpse of heaven, and the worst of life uh, of glimpse is a glimpse of hell. And he goes on, he says this, with Christians, this present life is the closest they will come to hell. In other words, if you live in a believer, the evil that you see here, one day you're not going to see. This is the worst it's going to get for us. It's only going to get better after this. However, for those who are unbelievers, it is the closest they will come to heaven. In other words, the goodness that you see here, it's limited. When you go to hell, there will be no goodness at all. You won't see any of that. So you might say, well, Pastor, why wouldn't God just show us all of it? Why won't he just open up the gates and just show us you know, heaven so that we can see it? And here's why. Because seeing the works of God and the glory of God does not always lead to belief. Right? Adam and Eve saw the works and the glory of God. Did they believe his word? No. They doubted and they hate and they sinned. That's why they were cast out of the garden. What happened in Israel? When God took the Israelites out of slavery, right? They were living as slaves. They didn't like their life. But God delivered them and he delivered them all. Like He sent all these plagues across the nation of Israel and delivered the Israelites through all of them. Then he took them through the, he took an ocean, split in half, they marched through the ocean, and then they turned around and watched them drown, drown in the entire Egyptian army. God demonstrated his power in a clearly, in a clearly vivid way. There would be no mistake. And yet, what did they do when they were out in the wilderness? They turned around and created their own calf and started worshiping and started praising the calf for delivering them. Or we talked about this as we were going through the kingdom series, right? When Jesus was going through some of the cities throughout uh, Judea, throughout Israel, and doing miracles. And he says, woe to you, Chorus, and woe to you, Bethsaida. And he also, right, in, in other places too, he says, for miracles, if the miracles were done in you that have been done in Tyre and Sidon, would have been done in Tyre Titan. They would have repented, slapped the clutch, and ashes, ashes long ago. You see, when we, because there's a spiritual reality that we don't often think about. When we see his works, and we see his glory, and we still don't believe, there's even a greater judgment for us. So really, it's God's mercy that he doesn't show us all these things, because there is a permanence about it. He's reaching out to us in a gentle way. You see, God has left us all the proof that he has needed in his word. You remember when we were talking about the rich man? His heart had not changed while he was down there. But he pleaded with Abraham. He said, Father, he said, I beg you to send him. He wants it there again. He's treating Lazarus as a, as a, um, uh, as a uh, servant. I beg you to send him to, to my father's house because I have five brothers to warn them so that they won't also come to this place of torment. And look at Abraham's response. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. In other words, God has been revealing himself all throughout. Starting with Moses, like all the way through the prophets. Yeah, at that time, it would have been the whole Old Testament. And, and look at this. Is, this is his response. Look at he says, no, no. He knew them. He knew them. He knew his heart. He knew the hearts of his brothers. He said, no, Father, no, he said. But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. In other words, if you do something miraculous, like sending this, this guy to, to be the messenger, right? Um, they're, you know, they would see, oh, here's some kind of ooh, mystical experiences. But look at his response. He says, but he told them, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded if someone rises from the that's what Jesus was talking about when he says how narrow is the gate and how difficult. Um, in that next slide, you'll see how he says how difficult the road is that leads to life. Right? That's the difficulty. Because our hearts are so stubborn. That's the miracle about the kingdom. Is that God overcomes our brokenness, you see. But here's the good news. We talk about the narrow way, right? There, There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given by which men may be saved. It is the name of Jesus. It's only through him. Like we said last week, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father, what? Except by me. So we can know which realm we are going to go and spend eternity. We can know this. 
if we choose to believe God's word. You see, we jump into Revelation and we get a glimpse into the throne room. And John says this, So I looked, and I saw surrounded by the throne animals, elders, and a lamb slaughtered by, sla slaughtered, but standing tall. Who's the lamb? That was Jesus. And Jesus, who was killed, is now standing. Jesus came. He had paid the price. And all everyone in heaven knows this. They saw when Jesus lived here on earth. They saw how he was treated by his own creation. And they saw how he willingly allowed himself to be led to the cross and how he willingly allowed himself to be nailed to the cross, how he willingly allowed himself to be speared. Angels probably looking down upon this going, how could this possibly be? These, uh, all of these elders, all these people knowing, some, some perhaps questioning, why would God do this but, not under, but understanding his holiness and his greatness and his nature? And so it says, if we jump down to verse 9, it says, and they sang a new song, worthy. Who's worthy? Jesus only. Take the scroll and open its seals. Slain. Pain and blood. You bought men and women. They understood that Jesus paid the price. Jesus is the way to life. And if we believe that and trust that, we're not trusting in our good works. We're not trusting in the things that we do because our good, our bad, always outweighs our good. The only way we can be made righteous by trusting in the perfect work of Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for those who have come to join us this morning. And I ask that, Lord, that if there be one person who does not understand, who has not seen, who has not known, who has not tasted of your goodness and forgiveness, that today would be the day. Thank you for those that have continued to follow us on this journey. I pray for those who are believers, Father, that they are have today, that we have been strengthened in our faith and in our walk with you. That we are more encouraged and more zealous to want to be a part of, of heaven. To want to be a part in a, to be in a relationship with you. We ask this humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to thank you so much for watching and for studying with us. If you have comments or questions, Please don't hesitate to uh, to leave those below. Um, if you can if you can uh, minister to us in some way through through your gift, if you've been blessed, I encourage you to to share in that. Um, you can give by sending a, a check or bringing it by the church to Lemon Green Street, Cumberland. We do have a black box out out front of the mailbox. You just slip it in there. It's locked. It's safe. Um, nobody can get into it until the secretary comes. She'll she'll get it. But. Um, the other way is, to, is and nowadays, right, is the, to do it electronically. If you scan this barcode, and um, you can also find the link on our webpage. Um, but if you scan this, it will take you directly to our giving page. So we'll be very thankful for your gifts. And um, I want to thank you for joining us, and have a good weekend. We'll see you next week as we continue through our series on heaven, and hope that you are blessed. Thank you, and God bless.